I can't remember how old I was when I read my first detective novel, but I definitely wasn't a teenager yet. I devoured my first Agatha Christie, the Miss Marple short story collection The Thirteen Problems, if you were wondering, under the covers on a family holiday when I was 11, after finding it on the shelf at the bed and breakfast we were staying in. A satisfyingly sneaky point of origin for this whodunit obsession of mine, but not really accurate as it happens. It really depends how you define detective novel. Long before I came upon my first Christie by chance that summer, I'd been reading mystery stories written for children, principally Enid Blyton's The Secret Seven and Five Find Outers series, as well as Louise Fitzhugh's seminal novel Harriet the Spy. I think the crime fiction bug must really have bitten me around my seventh birthday. It's only recently, though, that I've been thinking more critically about mystery fiction aimed at children and young people. Given the lengths that society goes to to make sure that kids don't see films and television programmes with, quote, inappropriate themes, it seems incongruous that books where thefts, threats of violence and even murders are essential to the plot are not only available to younger readers, but actually written especially for them. Yet such mysteries are a booming subgenre of today's crime fiction publishing industry. Generations of writers, going right back to the golden age of detective fiction and beyond, have written whodunits for younger readers. And these books aren't just for children and teens, they're about them too. So today, we're going to meet the young sleuths. Welcome to She Done It. I'm Caroline Crampton. A quick housekeeping note before I get into today's episode proper. A She Done It related project that I've been working on for the last few months is going to be available for pre order very soon, along with a special early bird incentive for keen eared listeners to the show. To be the first to know all about what this is and how you can get it, sign up for the podcast's newsletter at the link in the show notes or at shedoneitshow.com slash newsletter, because as soon as I'm allowed to share the full details, that's where I'll be doing it. During the 18th and into the 19th century, literature for children gradually shifted from being dominated by religious and moralising texts to stories that aimed to entertain rather than instruct. Didacticism gave way to fun, and the mid-19th century saw the arrival of adventure stories, school stories, and imaginative masterpieces like Alice in Wonderland that all aimed to give pleasure to younger readers. There's plenty of mystery in children's literature that has nothing to do with detection. Indeed, you might argue that Lewis Carroll's stories are mysteries, since Alice spends most of the books trying to work out what's going on. For instance, Frances Hodgson Burnett's best-known books, Little Lord Fauntleroy, A Little Princess, and The Secret Garden, all feature young protagonists embroiled in some kind of mystery, albeit a mystery more to do with their own identity and future than any sort of actual crime. But the first book to feature a true child detective is generally considered to be Emile and the Detectives by Erich Kästner, originally published in German and widely translated for other languages. Appropriately, it appeared during the golden age of detective fiction for adults that was going on between the world wars. Emile was published in Germany in 1929 and then in English in 1931. It's really an extraordinary book and I highly recommend reading it if you haven't already. It's set in 1920s Berlin and sees 12-year-old schoolboy Emile assemble a gang of other kids, the detectives of the title, to help him catch a mysterious thief who stole his money while he was sleeping on a train. As an origin point for children's detective fiction, Emile and the Detectives makes total sense. Many of the tropes that became common in the genre are present, from the family troubles that see Emile sent, unsupervised, to stay with his aunt in Berlin, to the group of young sleuths that band together to solve the case. The contemporary, unsanitised setting also set it apart. Emile and his comrades inhabit a fairly accurate version of Berlin, 
a city where the Weimar regime was in its dying days and the Nazis were gaining ground. The book was instantly popular, selling millions of copies across Europe and America. With Emile and the Detectives, Kessner hit upon the central tension that informs all young adult detective fiction. Adults are a mystery to children, and children are a mystery to adults. They inhabit different worlds. Grown-ups create and enforce rules that kids then subvert, creating imaginative spaces where they can thrive without restriction. Although it's not a mystery, you see the beginnings of this dichotomy in the work of J.M. Barry, in which the technicolour world inhabited by Peter Pan and the rest stands in stark contrast to the everyday greyness of normal life. The next major development for young sleuths came from Enid Blyton. Over 50 of her books have the word mystery or secret in the title a figure that gives you an indication of just how vital this format was to her output. In the first novel in her Secret series, 1938's The Secret Island, she focused in on what was to become a very important aspect of children's detective fiction, the isolation of the young sleuths from the adults. In this story, the parents of Peggy, Mike and Nora have been killed in a plane crash, leaving them to be brought up by a disinterested and unpleasant aunt and uncle. In this instance, the trio runs away to live in secret on an island in a lake where they have their adventures. But writers have found plenty of other means to leave their protagonists unsupervised. Schools are a popular setting for this reason, as are holidays and camps. Any scenario where a community of young people can plausibly exist with minimal intervention from adults will work. Enid Blyton wrote several mystery series concurrently. The Famous Five first appeared in 1942, with Five on a Treasure Island. Then The Five Find Outers appeared in 1943 with The Mystery of the Burnt Cottage. The Secret Seven turned up in their eponymous debut in 1949. Although it's The Five Find Outers books that arguably most closely conform to the tropes and ideals of Golden Age detective fiction, in all of these strands, Blyton has the essential ingredients for a young sleuthing mystery. A group of child detectives free to investigate in the adult world with minimal supervision, who inhabit a recognisable world and aren't afraid to take on the criminals themselves. Detective fiction for adults from this time was flourishing, of course, but rarely included children in its plots in a major way. Agatha Christie did write a school-based mystery with schoolgirl characters, 1959's Cat Among the Pigeons, but it's still the adults who do most of the heavy lifting in the plot, and Hercule Poirot, who ultimately solves the case. More interesting in this regard is Gladys Mitchell, who began writing crime fiction during the Golden Age, and is known today for her 66 whodunits featuring reptilian sleuth Mrs Bradley. However, beginning in 1936, she did write a series of standalone books for younger people, several of which straddle the divide between mystery and adventure. These are mostly out of print now and difficult to get hold of, But I do own a copy of 1948's Holiday River, and it is a very fine Norfolk Broads mystery, starring a cohort of teenagers on an unsupervised boating holiday. I believe Mitchell mostly wrote these books as a money-spinning enterprise, probably inspired by the success of The Famous Five and Co. earlier in the decade. Her career as a schoolteacher also gave her a great familiarity with young people. Indeed, her 1949 book The Seven Stones Mystery and 1950's The Mallory Secret, do sound like they could have been written by Enid Blyton herself. The children's librarian Eileen Colwell once famously mocked the premise of Blyton's mysteries for children, saying, What hope has a band of desperate men against four children? And of course there is some suspension of disbelief required to enjoy the way in which 11-year-olds over and over again confront armed smugglers and escape unscathed. But I think what this question gets at is the way that classic cerebral detection can level the playing field for young sleuths. Yes, they are physically outmatched by the adults they investigate, but the knowledge that they gather gives them power. Young sleuths keep secrets from grown-ups, withholding and revealing what they know accordingly to get what they want, whether that's to keep their guardians off their backs or to convince the police that they really have caught a gang of criminals. There's also safety in numbers. Blyton and most other creators of Young Sleuths don't tend to write about solo detectives. Like Emile, 
they always have a group of friends to back them up, and they have a corporate identity together that is much stronger than that of an individual child. Above all, the young sleuth's most powerful weapon is their marginalisation. Children are outsiders in the adult world, able to move about undetected and eavesdrop on conversations in a way that someone older would never be able to manage. Adults tend to underestimate and dismiss young people's ideas too, which can be very useful for detecting. It's no accident that young sleuths in fiction often pick up cases that the police have disregarded, or investigate problems that conventional detectives don't consider suspicious anyway. The imaginative leaps that kids make place them in opposition to the rule-following of their older counterparts. In the very first episode of She Done It, I talked about the idea of surplus women, and how the invisibility of spinster sleuths like Miss Marple create the perfect conditions for detection. And there's something very similar at work here. Outsiders of all kinds make for good detectives, Consider the foreignness of Hercule Poirot, for instance. And young people are no exception. After the break, how do you create a young sleuth today, in the age of the internet? This episode of She Done It is sponsored by Dear Homes, a male-based Victorian mystery game. In the US, Father's Day is coming up very soon on the 20th of June, And this could be the perfect present for a mystery-loving parent. Every week, you or your chosen gift recipient will receive an actual real letter in the post that contains fascinating clues to help you solve a monthly mystery set in the Victorian period. At the end of the month, Sherlock Holmes himself will write to you and reveal his solution to the puzzle. So your challenge is to beat him to it. How you choose to investigate is entirely up to you. You can make it a group effort, perhaps involving friends and family in thrashing out the details of the case, or you can unravel the mystery all by yourself. What could be more perfect for the She Done It listener in search of a Who Done It based distraction? To give this as a gift or to join for yourself, visit dearhomes.com. That's Holmes as in Sherlock Holmes, H O L M E S, and enter promo code She Done It to get $5 off your first order. That's dearhomes.com and code She Done It for $5 off. It's all very well marooning your young sleuths on an island in 1938, when even using the telephone to call for help was a bit of a novelty. Is it even possible, though, to create a plausible and readable young detective character in today's world? Although there are plenty of mystery books aimed at younger readers published these days, lots of them get round the issue of smartphones and TikTok by setting their plots in the past. One of the best-known series of this type is by Robin Stevens, who has been a guest on this show a couple of times before. Her Murder Most Unladylike books are set at a girls' boarding school in the 1930s and star a pair of exemplary young sleuths, Hazel Wong and Daisy Wells, who fight crime with their wits and a notebook. I think people go back largely because it's fun. Also, no phones, no cell phones. And no internet. The internet ruins a lot of things in terms of being able to easily access information or just call someone if you're in trouble. So there's a lot of phone destroying that I think sometimes has to happen in in stories. This is Maureen Johnson. She's a lifelong fan of classic detective fiction and was a successful writer of non-mystery fiction before she began publishing the Truly Devious series about teenage detective Stevie Bell in 2018. The first book I remember, full book I ever remember reading was The Hound of the Baskervilles. I had a children's edition of it. And I was so entranced by the first image of the reflection in the teapot that I, I, for, that was it, sort of for life. I was, I was taken from that moment And I got my hands on every mystery I could possibly get my hands on. And I always meant to write a mystery and I didn't. I've written YA for for years and years and I didn't do it because I think I thought it was too good for me or it was what I enjoyed the most. And so I didn't do it. It's very hard. I think sometimes maybe we avoid the thing that's too close to the thing that we love. When she set out to write the first Stevie Bell book, Truly Devious, Maureen worked hard to engineer the scenario that would allow a teenager from today to plausibly investigate a crime. 
This meant building a school, one which was haunted by a cold case from the 1930s that a new student in the 21st century raised on detective fiction and true crime podcasts would be desperate to investigate when she arrived. I created the rules of Ellingham for her. I created the architecture of the school for her, the location of the school for her, because I had to explain why she was 16 years old and a detective, which is difficult. As a frequent listener of this show, I love it how you, I love how you break down where the various detectives come from and their background. So they're either kind of unusual people, they're always older, they're ex-detectives, they're, they've been personally roped in, they're all, I guess, rarer that they're personally roped into a case, but I built a school that could accommodate and allow a student detective to flourish and investigate a cold case from 1936 to her heart's content. And I built it absolutely along classic mystery lines. I built the manor. I put it in a remote location. I put a detective in there. Although Ellingham Academy was established in the late 1920s, and Maureen is drawing on the country house murder mysteries of that period, Stevie is very much a teenager of today. So how do you slot those two very disparate things together to make one readable whodunit? It doesn't make any sense. But I think it makes more sense now than it ever has because of so much citizen detective work that's going on because of cold cases, internet interest, podcasts, things that people are actually taking part in, in investigations, kind of, who are complete amateurs in a way that was only written about and are solving them are helping to solve real life cases. So I'm sure at this point, a 16 year old with a very active interest in a cold case could get involved in it. It it makes a lot more sense now than it ever did in the past, which is helpful. This is a really important point and one which plays a large role in the latest Stevie Bell book, The Box in the Woods, which has just been published this month. Although there are lots of reasons why our greater connectivity makes it harder to create a compelling young sleuth. The way media is changing also provides opportunities. In her latest adventure, Stevie is invited to a summer camp by a wealthy true crime enthusiast who wants her to solve a mystery from 1978, when four young workers at the same camp were found brutally murdered in the woods. But she's not being called in because her backer wants justice for the victims. No, he wants to make a hit true crime podcast about the story that might get optioned as a movie and he thinks it will have a greater chance of success if they can exclusively reveal who done it. As well as this clever justification for why an adult would consult an internet-famous teenage detective, Maureen's choice of location is also her answer to one of the fundamental problems of writing a young sleuth. How do you get them out from their family home and out there taking risks in the world? It was the summertime, something where I could gather the characters back in one location again that gave me the right atmosphere that gave me the right kind of again location gathering young people together is is hard you have a few options you think places like schools or camps later on you'll have universities but you have to they can't just get up and go they don't have jobs they don't you know they they have to go where they're told in a lot of ways so this was a way of gathering people in one place And it's a very always anything that happens in a dark, you know, dark woods. And certainly there's a there's an air of danger with the summer camp. They're really not very dangerous. They're fine. But, you know, it's it's the spooky nature of the summer camp and the stories around the campfire. The parallel narratives between the crime in 1978 and Stevie's present day investigation of it allows Maureen to bring out the differences in the way young people are treated then and now. The relative freedom of the 1970s, when teenagers could slip off into the woods and nobody really worried about it, versus the constant check-ins required of today's young people, are leveraged for the plot. They have tools to help them know where they're at. But sometimes they don't work. The GPS doesn't necessarily work correctly in the woods or they lose their phones. Or it's, and I think it's much more frightening now to lose your tether, to not have that machine to help you out. 
you know, or the one that we even just wear on our wrist that says, you know, you can call for help. You can, I can tell you where you're at. But yeah, I hopefully t- tried to bring about the striking contrast between these two times. Another challenge is that Maureen's books aren't just about young sleuths. They're written for them, too. The Truly Devious series is officially classified as young adult, a publishing category that usually means it's pitched at readers aged 12 to 18. I've been using the terms children's literature and younger readers fairly interchangeably in this episode so far, but it is worth noting that different publishing industries around the world do separate books into fairly specific categories like this, according to the age of the imagined reader. For instance, in the US, the age range below YA is called middle grade, and it's for readers aged 8 to 12. Anyway, the point is that Maureen is writing a character who is meant to be roughly the same age as many of her readers. And that's not always easy when you've left your own teenage years behind you. So how does she do it? I've been doing it for a while. And one thing you have to accept, I think, right off the bat, is that anything that you're writing now, the second you commit it to paper, it's dated. So anything that exists in terms of technology, or especially technology, will be old very, very quickly. And that's okay, actually. It's okay to have a little timestamp on that. So I think the trick is a little bit to keep it general and a little general, that there are cameras, that there are phones, but listing really specific apps or techniques is going to give you a little less, it's either going to give you less shelf life or it will very clearly date where you are. This is one of the things that really make the Stevie Bell books live and breathe, I think. Technology does play its part. In The Box in the Woods, Stevie and her friend Janelle make very good use of some internet-enabled home security cameras. But ultimately, the plots are constructed along classic lines. The case is solved because of Stevie's deductions, not because of the apps on her phone. As I alluded to earlier, mystery fiction for younger readers has to grapple with notions of what is appropriate – whether it's acceptable to introduce violence and gore into a story that a child might pull off the library shelf and read before an adult can intervene. I was keen to hear Maureen's take on this and learn whether there were any restrictions on what she can and can't include in Stevie's cases. There really aren't. And somebody asked me recently, they said, oh, you, why has gotten darker and you can do more now? No, it's it's always been okay to write fairly fairly dark young adult stories. I mean, there was one when I was growing up called Killing Mr. Griffin, which was came out in 1978 by Lois Duncan, who wrote many very dark young adult books. That That's about a group of teenagers who kill their English teacher and dump his body. I mean, it was genuinely a terrifying book. There's really never been a I don't think there's ever been a limit on what you can discuss. I think they're more technical now. And I think the technical aspect comes from people's interest in true crime. And just that you're used to hearing that cases are solved through DNA or something like that, through digital monitoring of some kind. The Box in the Woods, and the other truly devious novels then, manage something that feels rare. Their books written now, set in the present, that are squarely built on the foundations of the classic 1920s puzzle mystery. The characters have phones, it's true, but they haven't forgotten how to use their brains. It's a difficult trick to pull off, so how does Maureen do it? Remembering that it's not just, you know, the body on the ground. Even though I've got a lot of respect for the body you find in the library and the body you find in the sarcophagus and under the bed. And of course, like all of us, I just want to find one someday. No matter how old we are, we're all still young sleuths at heart. This episode was written and narrated by me, Caroline Crampton. 
Many thanks to my guest Maureen Johnson. Her latest young adult detective novel, The Box in the Woods, is out now in the US and the UK, available from all good booksellers. Links to this and all the other books and sources mentioned in the episode are available at shedoneitshow.com slash young sleuths. I publish transcripts of every episode, including this one. Find them all at shedoneitshow.com slash transcripts. If you'd like to support the podcast's continued existence, become a paying member of the She Done It book club and get access to two bonus episodes a month and the reading community. Sign up at shedoneitbookclub.com slash join. She Done It is edited by Ewan McAleese. Member support for the She Done It book club from Conan McLaughlin. The podcast's advertising partner is Multitude. Thanks for listening. I'll be back soon with another episode.